most people don't think about where their water comes from. They just turn on the tap and they expect it to be there. Those days are ending. Humans are changing the climate. We already see evidence about it. One of the most significant impacts of climate change will be on our water resources. This notion that we'll have water forever is wrong. The world is running out of fresh water. That's a clip from the documentary Flow, which raises the question, how valuable is our water? And what's the best way to preserve it? Privatization and commodification or asserting a public's right? Battles are playing out from California to Kentucky with some of the world's most powerful companies in the mix. What's the best approach? Well, for answers, at least some, we go to Susan Leal. She's co-author of Running Out of Water, The Looming Crisis and Solutions to Conserve Our Most Precious Resource. She was the head of San Francisco's Public Utilities Commission and is a senior fellow at Harvard. And Anna Lenzer, investigative journalist with the Investigative Fund of the Nation Institute, who wrote about Fiji water in The Nation magazine last year. Well, welcome, both of you. Thank um, you. Let's start with you, Susan. Lay out the degree to which we are running out of water. Is this a today, tomorrow, right now kind of a problem? In some places, it's right now. We are in a collision course, though. Remember, we have from our early school, school time, we got the picture of what water was. And it's that cy water cycle. And basically, we've had the same amount of water on our planet since the beginning of time, since prehistoric man or prehistoric woman. But now that Earth is being shared, that water is being shared by 6.7 billion people. So we are in a collision course between a very finite supply, that same amount of water since the beginning of time, and now 6.7 billion people. Within 15 years, we'll have 8 billion people sharing that same amount of water. And as you mentioned, we've got climate change. Mm. And that does complicate matters uh, in several places around the globe. And when you talk about here and now, there are 33 states in the U.S. that are already under water stress. How did you get into this topic, Anna? How did you find yourself flying off to Fiji to report on Fiji water? Uh, well, my interest in water goes a long way back to when I was in school actually studying science um, in Canada. And I really had a scientific environmental interest. Um, and what you see in that field is water, quick, it quickly becomes apparent that water is the common element binding all of our environmental crises, the climate crises. You know, the climate cycle is fundamentally a hydrological cycle. Um, and I guess I was really concerned about a lack of proper communication and, you know, aggressive investigative journalism to match what, you know, as Susan describes, is like an earth shattering a water shock that's to come. So. I had a water interest going back to then, and um, basically I started looking at water when I moved here and, and got interested in journalism. Um, and sort of one of the first companies that struck my eye, you know, really looking at privatization was Fiji Water. All right, well, let's play a clip which lays out some of the problems with Fiji, as you did so well yeah. in your article last year. Take a look. Fiji Water is America's leading imported bottled water. Its makers have spent millions marketing it as a progressive green product. Paris Hilton, Diddy, Lindsay Lohan, even President Obama are happy customers. But would they drink it if they knew that Fiji Water bottles use twice the plastic of other major water brands? That many residents of Fiji don't have access to potable water, and the islands are often plagued by drought? That Fiji Water Company enjoys perks such as tax-free status from a repressive military junta? You wrote about this in pretty stark terms, Anna. When you came away this distance later, a year later, has anything changed? Do you have any warmer feelings towards the Fiji water bottling companies? Um, I don't. I actually have to say the situation in Fiji has gotten worse. I mean, I've been tracking it since the story came out. And of course, I listened to the company's reaction, which contained just a series of falsehoods. But you know, just within the last year, we've seen um, Fiji's had one of the worst droughts in its history. Um, it has a dry season and a flooding season. But this fall, um, you know, the wells just around the Fiji water factory were going dry. There was pictures leaking out of, you know, the classic scorched earth image you get from, from Africa. From a, you know, that's happening right next to the Fiji water factory. People couldn't get water. And the government actually declared, went so far as to declare martial law surrounding water, surrounding reporting on water. So reading, um, reading <laughs> Anna's piece and looking at documentaries like that, you could end up coming away, Susan, with saying, well, privatization is obviously wrong. Bottling is clearly problematic. Um, Maud Vallo has been on this program making that case. You say, wait, not quite so fast. There's well, some gray area here. Well, I do believe in government-run utilities. Uh, let me state that very clearly. 
but we've also seen where you can bring in the private sector and have them as a partner, as an ally. Give us an example from your San Francisco well, for, experience. Well, for example, where we worked with, um, there in north of San Francisco in the wine country, there you had a, a geopower plant, the water had run dry, and then they were able to partner with a government-run utility just nearby where they were needed to get rid of their wastewater. Their wastewater had been dumped into a, a recreational river. So instead of dumping that wastewater, that sewer water into the recreational river, that government-run utility partnered with that private utility. And now that private utility is providing power. It's no longer dry, dry holes under that geothermal plant. They're powering one million homes. And at the same time, that utility, for the first time in 120 years, is not dumping its wastewater, its sewer water, into a recreational so river. So the relationship gave you, as the utility operators, the public operators, right. a sort of relationship that could also regulate. Right. And also, we, we, it, it, the utility was in charge of its water. And I think that where you involve people, where you give po people the power in, in, in running their water, we really saw success. And we described several of those success stories in our book. In, in Brazil, where the, in the slum dwellers, when, we involved, when they were involved by the government, but also with the business community, while they were involved in their water system, they were able to gain access to safe drinking water and basic sanitation. Now, the business uh, community makes their own argument. Here's an example on Fox News recently. Take a look. California's had a tough time with water. There are three other states you say are really running out of water right now. What are they? Well, they're the three at the bottom of the Colorado River, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. Where do we need to start with this, and, and can investors cash in? Well, there's only, uh, only 10 uh, publicly traded water companies. 85% of the market is municipal. That's part of the problem. In municipal governments, there's no incentive to invest, uh, whereas private companies do, but we have to then raise prices, although it's a minimal amount. We, we serve the average home for a penny a gallon with all the water you want. Uh, so it's, it's not an expensive commodity. So, Anna, is that the problem, that there aren't enough municipalities with enough motivation to make the water uh, as pure and as well-regulated as it should be? I, I really think it's just a broad problem with how we deal with water. I mean, this discussion of privatization of utilities, and we're talking about the West, I mean, 10% of the water is going to household use. And we're talk looking at the other 90%, which Susan writes a lot about, which is going to agriculture. You know, and the fact that we're sort of putting this whole water you know, crisis is going to be solved by privatization and putting it down to the individual consumer. I mean, to me, there's almost a parallel with the bailout where we're putting the crunch on you know, the little people and we're giving these massive subsidies, massive you know, water subsidies in the West that are going to agriculture. Also, you know, the way we can basically are not enforcing clean water laws. Um, the New York Times just reported a few weeks ago enforcement's going down. And you um, have fights breaking out. I mean, right now there's a big fight in Kentucky where the Tea Party folks right. are saying the EPA is too onerous for our state and we don't need it to be as clean as the EPA wants it to be anyway. Well, the, the bottom line is, do you want public health? And why we started with the Clean, the clean Water Act was started during the Nixon administration. And it's because the, the Cayuga River was on fire. And so we knew we had, for basic public health, we have to have wastewater treatment. We have to have water treatment. But what about the private company's argument that they have the, the motivation and the money look, to do that treatment? Look, it all work. comes down to all of us. We have to pay the rates for the water. And that's what the Tea Party people, at least what I understand what they're arguing, people don't want to pay the rates. It doesn't matter if it's a private company running it or, or a, a public company, but you still rate paper ratepayers still have to pay. And with a government-run utility, I believe you have, then it's owned by those people who are actually paying the rates. And to blame the utilities, the, the problem with the, or the publicly run or municipal utilities, the problem is, is that there hasn't been the political courage uh, to raise rates, to invest in, in our infrastructure. Our infrastructure, according to the GAO, our infrastructure, is falling behind twenty billion dollars, and I think a year. the water infrastructure is amongst is is in that infrastructure that's in the sites of the deficit commission. One of the very many public service cuts is in the area of water security at the federal level. Well, I, I think people are putting blinders on because it's not only an issue of water supply, cleaning our water, and delivering clean water, but it's the basic public health 
for example, why that river was on fire many years ago. Now we have beach, in the same time you were having beach closures in the Gulf Coast, there were beach closures all over the U.S., Great Lakes, Rhode Island, New Jersey. It was because the wastewater systems have aged out and they were overwhelmed with increasing population. That we have to invest in. That's our, that's our public health, that's our water. Final thought from you, I know we've only got about 10 seconds left, but with respect to people who are looking at all those bottled waters in their groceries, what's your advice? Uh, my advice is to look at your tap water and see how it needs to be filtered. I mean, we're very lucky in the United States, we have, we have drinkable water. Go that way. Thank you both. There's information Thanks. about the book and about Anna's articles at our website, grittv.org, and there's more information coming up.